60 after you hit 30. <laughs> I'm not trying to discourage any of you young people. <laughs> We're in Luke chapter number 13 today. I enjoy the Christmas season. I enjoy the songs, enjoy the, the thoughts. And a few people are nice because it's Christmas. And then there's a few old crabs and there's some crazy drivers and elbow to elbow rude people in the store and things like that. But I'm glad that, that we can have this season. And I want to read Luke chapter number 13 and beginning in verse number one. Luke chapter 13, verse number one. There were present at that season some that told him, Jesus, of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those 18 upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all the men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. He said unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth, or why does it take up space and nutrients in our field? Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you today. Thank you for your love to us. Thank you for the honesty and straightforwardness of the scriptures that cuts right through the red tape, takes us to the heart of the issue that men must repent. I pray that you'd bless us today in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And... Uh, some would say, well, preacher, how come on Christmas, the, it's not Christmas today, but it's the last Sunday before Christmas, and why a text on repentance <laughs> instead of a Christmas sermon? Well, there's several reasons why we're preaching on this text. Number one, it's next in line in the book of Luke that we started on a year ago. And our commitment was to preach through it paragraph by paragraph, verse by verse, chapter by chapter until we get to the end of the book. And so this passage was next in line. So that's one reason. And there's a second reason. The message of Jesus, the one who we worship and adore at Christmas time, his message was repentance. And he preached it all throughout his earthly ministry. And third reason is our culture is inundated with a lot of strange notions about what Christmas really is. <laughs> Everybody, I mean, if you watch the Hallmark Channel, you'll find out that Christmas there, according to them, is that uh, in all of their movies, it's the beautiful young lady who goes to the sleepy little town at Christmas time, which is always covered by snow, unlike Arkansas that has 70 degree weather at Christmas. And, uh, and this beautiful lady who is engaged to this wealthy man suddenly finds that she's attracted to the poor guy who's dressed in a red flannel shirt and she jilts the rich man and marries the man in the red flannel shirt who drives the old pickup. It's all about romantic love. Do you think that maybe is what Christmas is really about? <laughs> and then, uh, of course, if you, you hear all these voices suggesting the real reason for the season, and then you'll hear uh, those who, those, maybe those shows or movies that want to preserve the magic of Christmas by an aging Santa who's getting too old for the job and he's got to select a new Santa to take his place so that magic 
and miracles can take place at Christmas times. And so you've got those. And then you've got a few that have Jesus in the manger at Christmas time, very few. Most of them don't even mention the name of Jesus in their Christmas shows. <laughs> but you'll have a few, uh, thank goodness, that have Jesus in the manger, but you won't hear anything about his life, his suffering, his ministry, his preaching, his death on the cross, his resurrection and ascension back to heaven, and the giving of the word of God that says men must repent or none of this in heaven will be yours. And so we don't even need to be reminded about those who celebrate Christmas as just a secular holiday, and they're all about having alcohol-saturated parties and uh, all sort of wantonness, and so those certainly exist. But we're focusing today on what this text focuses on. Yes, Jesus was the babe in the manger, but that wasn't why he came ultimately. He ultimately required after his death that men would see the cross and repent and turn to him for salvation. And so repentance is the message for today. It was the message in the Old Testament. When the Old Testament prophets, the Old Testament prophets would preach with a fiery tongue and say to Israel, repent or perish. And the very last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, Malachi tells those Jewish leaders in Israel, you must repent. Quit being a hypocrite saying you're religious. Repent and trust the Lord and follow him. And then you have the New Testament opening with John the Baptist preaching the message, repent. And then Jesus himself, after being baptized by John in the River Jordan, it immediately says in Matthew 3, 2, uh, Jesus began to preach saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So the message of repentance is the ultimate reason that Jesus came as a babe in the manger to give people the message to repent and come to him. Well, <clears throat> let me give you in this passage, let me give you three things about repentance today. Number one, we have here the realization of repentance. The realization. Notice once again that these people in verses 1, uh, 2, and 3, and 4, and five, those first five verses bring these men to the realization of repentance that bring the news to Jesus about this tragedy that happened in Israel where some men who were Galileans had, uh, and they were known, the Galileans were known in that particular time as being mean-spirited and seditious and and just brawlers and troublemakers. And so even the people at Jerusalem in Judea down in the south part of the country, they didn't much like the Galileans. They thought they were just a bunch of troublemakers. And so the news comes to Jesus here in verse number one of our text. It says there were present at that season, meaning at that season, at that time that was just mentioned back in chapter 12 that we covered last week, at that same approximate time, there's some men in amongst the disciples that tell Jesus, hey, did you hear about that tragedy? It's just happened recently. Did you hear about, did you hear about Pilate? Man, he, he killed a bunch of those Galileans that were seditious and trying to uh, stir up trouble about the Roman government. Did you hear that they were going to the taber, or they were going to the temple to sacrifice and they had their sacrifices already slain and ready to put on the altar and Pilate's men fell upon these men right there in the temple as they were sacrificing their bloody sacrifices. Pilate had them slain and their own blood was mixed with their sacrifices. Did you hear about that, Jesus? Well, they're looking to get Jesus to make a comment. But the title of our message gives uh, clearly what he was thinking and what he did. We're calling this message today the unexpected message. The unexpected message because they thought Jesus would make some political statement about Pilate or about the Roman government or they thought... <clears throat> These Galileans were such mean rascals, they deserved to die in the first place. 
Because they had at that time, they had the idea, and it's pretty much run through the culture, that they thought if anybody met up with a tragedy, an untimely death, an accident, that they must have some hidden sin that God got even with them. <laughs> and so anytime something like that happened, man, they thought, well, you remember, uh, remember the, man, the man born blind that Jesus uh, talked about later in the Gospels? And it said a man was born blind, and his own disciples say, Jesus, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Somebody must have done wrong or he wouldn't be blind. <laughs> That's what they're thinking. And they're saying, when bad things happen to people, it must be because they're outrageous sinners above all the rest of us. You know, we're not too bad people. It's those other guys. And that's why they're dead and we're still alive. And they thought maybe Jesus would get, jump in on the gossip and say, yeah, they were pretty bad sinners, so we killed them. <laughs> that's not what Jesus said. He didn't say anything about Pilate. He didn't say anything about the Roman government. He just went straight to the heart of the matter. And he said, I'll tell you one thing. He said, if, if you don't repent. He said, do you think these guys are sinners above all the others? He said, I'll tell you this. If you don't repent, you'll all likewise perish. <laughs> your sin may be in your eyes little and theirs may seem big, but everybody has to be acknowledging that they're a sinner and need repentance. And so he preached an unexpected message. Man, uh, somebody, uh, Jesus wasn't afraid to just tell it like it is. Huh? He didn't tell them what they wanted to hear. He told them what they needed to hear. <laughs> somebody said a pulpit committee in a church is, is a group of people who want to hire a preacher who will uncompromisingly, unfearingly, Tell it just like they want to hear it. <laughs> they thought maybe Jesus would get in on the gossip with them, but he didn't. You know what he said? Jesus basically said three things to them. He said, everybody's a sinner and needs to repent. Number two, he said, not every tragedy or difficulty is the result of extreme sin. There are good people who have accidents. There are good people who get cancer. There are good people who have heart attacks. There are good people who get all sorts of tragic things to happen to them. Now, let me say this. What Jesus is saying, just because somebody gets hurt in an accident or somebody gets killed doesn't mean that they're wicked above everybody else. We're all sinners. <laughs> and good people do die and good people get hurt. Now, of course, we do know the Bible teaches in Hebrews chapter 12 that there is such a thing as chastisement. If people don't listen to God, some people do get sick. We, even in the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, Paul said, because some take it unworthily, some are asleep or they've been killed. So there is such a thing as a judgment of God, but not everybody that has bad luck, as we call it, <laughs> is an extreme sinner. And so before we sell somebody down the river for being a bad guy, just like, remember when Paul, in, uh, in Acts, when Paul was on that island preaching to some natives and he's building a fire and a snake comes out of the bundle of wood and latches onto his hand and Paul's trying to scrape that thing off and he gets bitten by a venomous serpent. And some of those people, they even had that attitude on that island. They said he must be a, he must be a murderer or something or that wouldn't happen to him. <laughs> and sometimes we're kind of that way and we kind of say, you know, something bad happens to somebody and we figure they must have been doing wrong. I don't ever do wrong, but they must have. <laughs> well, Jesus is putting that to sleep. And then he teaches one other lesson to those men who bring him the news of the killing of the guys by Pilate and by those who died in the tower that fell over at the southeastern gate of Jerusalem. He, Jesus says, it's, it's not just those Galileans. You guys right here in Jerusalem, you had the wall of Siloam to fall on some people here. So it's not just those guys up yonder in Yankee land. <laughs> 
you sinners down here in Jerusalem could perish also, just like the ones the tower fell on. And so he's saying, lesson number three there is, unless you, unless you repent, you'll perish. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Jesus told it like it was. And sometimes when we hear a message that rubs us the wrong way, we get mad about it. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm not coming back to that church anymore. I ain't listening to another message to that preacher. Well, I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people who wouldn't hang around to hear Jesus preach today because he told it like it was. And he didn't tell them what they wanted to hear. He told them what they needed to hear. Now, notice the second thing we get out of this lesson in these nine verses. Number two, the recurrence of repentance. Jesus told them they needed to repent. But notice in the uh, next few verses, beginning in verse number six, he talks about a parable. And the, the parable is about, <clears throat> it's about the owner of the vineyard, which is an emblem of God the Father. And then there's a dresser of the vineyard who had been ministering to that vineyard to Israel for three years, just like Jesus had been ministering for three years. And then you've got Israel is the fig tree. Many times in the Bible, many times you'll see Israel or the fig tree as an emblem of Israel. And so he's saying in this parable, <clears throat> the father says, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Cut the tree down. Take Israel off. Take them out. Cut the tree down. I'm finished fooling with Israel. But Jesus, the dresser of the vineyard, says, well, I know what you mean, Father, but why don't we try just a little bit longer? Let me dig around that tree and see if I can loosen those bound roots and, and we'll put some fertilizer around the tree. We'll, we'll fertilize it and we'll take care of it and we'll try it again and see if we can't get some fruit on it next year. And I see a lesson there. Jesus is the God of second chances. He was tired of fooling with them, man. They had rejected him on every hand. He had preached his soul out. He had preached his heart out to those people and they wouldn't do anything to repent. And Jesus said, let's give them just a little bit more time, Father. And he granted it. I like that. So there is in the recurrence of repentance towards salvation, there is that second chance factor. Now don't count on it because you may have had your second chance already and just don't know it. <laughs> that would be bad, wouldn't it? If you're presuming upon a second chance, it doesn't say he's given third and fourth and fifth chances. He may, but he's not obligated. But I'm glad he gives second chances. That shows the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, I failed him before, and I thought, boy, it's a good thing I'm not God because I'd, I'd step on somebody like me. I'd step, step on some like me like a bug and just squash them. <laughs> and I deserved it. But I'm glad, aren't you? I'm glad Jesus got some patience and long suffering and some grace and mercy. And he said, I'm just going to wait a little while longer and give you another chance to straighten up. He does that for Christians as well as lost people. And you see, that's part of this recurring repentance. Repentance is not a one-time deal where you do it, and man, you're done with it. You repent to salvation, true, and that's a one-time deal. But after we get saved, it's not that we just got our fire insurance and now we can go along our merry way and we can go to those drunken Christmas parties and we can hoot it up and we can commit fornication and adultery and, and rob and steal and be rude and mean and do everything we want to do. No, a Christian, you see... What did Jesus say here? Or the father said that he wanted fruit off of that fig tree. You see, repentance looks towards not just a changing of the mind in a fickle sort of way. He's looking for fruit. God's looking for a repentance that is ongoing, recurring, and actually brings forth fruit. So this brings us to a discussion <clears throat> that I think is really the heart of the matter today. <clears throat> there are 
several ideas floating around and a few battles being fought over the definition of repentance. You know, do you just say, hey, Jesus loves you and he wants to save you. Will, will you accept him? Sure, I'll accept him. Is that repentance? Um, and then there's those who put maybe an emphasis on it to the point where they make salvation a works salvation. Repentance has to be such a thing that if you fail a little bit, that God will snuff you out and take you to hell. And so there's a ditch on both sides of the road. I'd kind of like to clear that up. I think you've heard me preach it before, but there is in salvation that instantaneous thing that happens when a person, when they receive the Lord, it has to be instantaneous. To be born again doesn't mean it takes months or years to be born again. It happens in a moment of time. When someone believes, as the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That believing takes place at a moment of time. Salvation is instantaneous. And the day you get saved, everything in your past is in the past. And from that moment forward, when you trusted Christ as Savior, everything in the future is secure. You have heaven promised. But let's talk about that instant that it happens when somebody truly repents, does it just mean that they had this little fuzzy emotion? Well, I'd like to have Jesus in my heart, so yeah, let me pray with you. Is that repentance? Salvation is instant, but if it's real, it results in fruit. That was our parable then said he to the dresser of this vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Now I realize that the fig tree is national Israel, but this application goes to the individual because in verses 1 through 5, he's talking to specific people in the crowd among his disciples. He said, Unless all of you repent, you shall likewise perish. So it's not just national Israel that he's speaking to. He's talking to every individual saying, except you repent, you'll perish. And <clears throat> the awful result is that if, if there's no fruit, what God expects, then there was probably nothing happened at that instant when somebody gets saved. Are you with me? Fruit is a result of having the right root. If you've got the root, you'll have the fruit. Now let's take it just a little bit further and let's get technical. Want to? Let's get technical. <laughs> let's talk about the definition of repentance. Those who practice soul winning in such a way that they are called by some easy believists or easy prayerists, you just get somebody to repeat a prayer and if they repeat the right words, then they're saved. I think the reason people who are that type of soul winner likes that, this, this definition of repentance that is just simply a, it's just a change of mind. It's the same thing as faith. You just believe on Jesus. There's nothing, it has nothing to do with sin, they say. And so they like it that way because they can get more notches on their gun belt that way. You see, if you talk to somebody about actually accepting the Lord as Savior and you mention anything about giving up sin or going to church, things like that, if that's a turnoff to them, they're not ready yet. If they just say the prayer to get you off of their front doorstep so they can go shopping, nothing took place in here. Let's, let's, let's take the definition uh, repentance must be defined according to the context and where it's found. You see, it's, repentance is like a lot of other words. It has different usages. And so, so many people say, well, the Greek, the Greek lexicon says that repentance is just a change of mind, so that's all there is to it. 
Well, it's used in different ways. Like, let me give you an example. Like the word saved. If I say, I'm saved, what do you automatically think first? Born again, child of God, right? I was in the creek one time and a little girl was floating down the creek. She was about to drown and I grabbed her and pulled her out of the water and I saved her. Now, does that word saved there mean that I rescued her soul? I have no idea about her soul. I saved her physical life. So the word saved. Now, if you use the word saved in the context of salvation of the soul, it really does mean saved once for all, forever, eternity. Salvation of the soul. So it depends on the context and where you find the word and repentance is the same way. It depends on how you find it. In the context of, of salvation, it can mean something different than it does in just everyday life. Certainly, repentance, listen to me, repentance, now this is where we've got to think on purpose. I'm trying to get you off of autopilot right now because I've preached a lot of messages in the past and, and right after the message, somebody asked me a question that was just answered in the message. I'm like, weren't they listening? So I'm trying, I'm trying to get you to think with me just a minute. The definition of repentance in its simplest and most generic form is change. You take that definition and stretch it just a little further and it means change of mind because if it doesn't change in your mind, it's probably not going to go any further than that. So we do recognize that repentance means change Stretch it a little further, it means change of mind. But when you stretch it further, it's a change of mind that results in a change of action. I mean, who cares if you change your mind if you're still the same old rascal you used to be? <laughs> Repentance generally carries with it the change of mind that leads toward change in action. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. He didn't come just to be worshipped as a babe in a manger. He came so that people would repent and he came to save them from their sins. So when we whitewash our salvation message and make it nothing more than just faith itself, the Bible talks about faith and repentance in the same verse. And they're obviously different. Two sides of one coin... True repentance can't happen without true faith and vice versa. But if it's real, they'll both be there. See, sometimes, sometimes repentance in the Bible just means a change of action and doesn't have to do with the salvation of the soul at all. And this is where our theologians today who argue for the easy prayerism and there are some who are vehemently against any mention of repentance and they say we're work salvationists if we mention repentance. Well, Jesus mentioned it if I, don't, if I remember right in this passage of Scripture and a whole bunch of other times. <laughs> repentance has a meaning and sometimes it just means in the context to change your action. It doesn't have anything to do with salvation of the soul. Remember the, the father in the scriptures it says, I believe it was Matthew 21, a certain man had two sons and he told one of them, he said, go work in my vineyard for me. He said, okay, I'll go. But he didn't go. And then the other boy, he said, go work in my vineyard. He said, no, sir, I'm not going to do it. But later he repented. And the word repented is used in those verses. He repented and went. Now, which one of those boys do you think satisfied his father that day? The one who said, I'll go, and he didn't? Or the one who said, I'll not go? But later he got to thinking about it and said, I'm going to go, and he went. Which one of them satisfied? The one that produced the fruit, the one that produced the action, the one who had a change of mind that went somewhere and did something. And when God the Father saves people, he means for them to change. But in this particular passage, he's not talking about salvation. He's just simply talking about a father who told two boys to go work. One of them did and one of them didn't. And so in that context, repentance just means a change of action. Well, it's a faulty 
interpretation when people say that repentance doesn't have anything to do with our actions. Repentance definitely heads in that direction. You see, now we're going back to this scenario of salvation now happening in a moment, in an instant of time. If it happens instantly, then we know that their actions in the future won't have anything to do with their salvation. Isn't that true? If you got saved today and then you didn't do a certain thing or you did do something you wasn't supposed to do tomorrow, that won't affect it because we believe in eternal security. So it's not a work salvation, but what we are saying that at that instant when somebody gets saved, the heart was touched, not just an intellectual assent. Yeah, if I repeat these words, I'll be saved. No, it's a heart saying, I've disappointed the Father. I have sinned. And because of that sin, I cannot go to heaven. I must repent. So what does repent mean at that moment? At that moment, since it can't have anything to do with the works in the future, it must have something to do with the heart's condition at that moment when salvation is given. So it has to be a heart not that just acknowledges God and Jesus historically. It has to be a heart that believes that he is a sinner and he develops a different attitude at that moment towards sin. Instead of loving his sin like he did in the past, instead of rejecting Christ and clinging to his sin, at that moment he says, sin is bad, I agree with God, I must accept Jesus because he'll forgive my sin. It it has to be a willingness to believe at that moment a willingness to say sin is bad, Jesus is good. Sin is bad, so I'm turning to Jesus who is good. It has to be a willingness. Some people don't like that word. Jack Chick, who wrote tracks for many, many years, there are some of the easy believism crowd, the quick prayerism crowd, crowd that say Jack Chick believed in work salvation. Well, nothing's further from the truth. I don't know Jack Chick's heart. I mean, he's in heaven now. But just because he said repentance means that a person is willing at the moment of salvation, willing to turn his back on sin doesn't mean it's a work salvation. It's a heart attitude. Jesus said, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the heart Man believeth unto righteousness. We cannot believe our way into heaven by believing historical facts alone. It has to be a heart that's been touched and a heart that recognizes that sin is bad and I must turn to Jesus. Now when somebody does that, a genuine born again experience happens in the heart and then tomorrow he may not live a perfect life. I can guarantee you that he won't. But tomorrow he'll have a different attitude about that sin And he'll say, you know, I used to drink. I'm not sure if I got the victory yet, but I'm going to try. It doesn't mean he's trying for his salvation. He got salvation back here at that moment. It's just that he has a new attitude now. And he says, I don't want to cuss anymore. Can he let a cuss word slip? Sure he can. Could he fall and take another drink out of the bottle? Sure he could. That doesn't mean he's not saved. That just means he's human. But at the same time, he'll still have that willingness, that attitude that's different about sin. You see, before I got saved, there wasn't much that I wouldn't do (laughs) that's wrong. But after I got saved, although long ways from perfect, I have an attitude that I don't want to sin. And I think that can describe the repentance to salvation is a different attitude not wanting to sin, not of sinless perfection, but of not wanting to sin, a willingness to have a changed life. Well, let me move on. The parable in our text says the owner of the vineyard wanted fruit. So that's the result. The third point in the message was the result of salvation. 
the result of true repentance is that it will lead toward a changed life. What does Jesus say about false teachers? He says, you shall know them by their fruit. So they said, well, you can't see a man's heart to know if he's really saved. No, I can't. Only God can see that. But doesn't the whole book of James give us an indication of what it's like to be justified before men? Not that we have to be to get to heaven. We've got to be justified before God by faith to be saved. But James talks about though a man say he hath faith, he says basically, you show me your faith without works and I'll show you my faith with my works. In other words, if we want to show other people, and God knows this world, this God forsaken world needs some Christians who will live different than the world and live different than they did before and people who have a testimony that will say Jesus can save lives. Drug addicts need somebody to demonstrate to them, hey, it can be different than wallowing in the sewer. Hey, it can be different, Mr. Dunkard, than throwing up your guts over a toilet bowl. It can be different, Mr. Adulterer, than going from one woman to the next to the next. It can be different and we need Christians who will not only repent to be saved, but will repent when they're shown from the scriptures that their life doesn't match what God expects. Fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is what we need. And this Christmas, I would like to remind all of us that going further than just worshiping and adoring a babe in a manger, I think it would satisfy Jesus more if we as Christians acknowledge when we're going in the wrong direction and turn our life around. You see, you can be truly saved and still do things you shouldn't do. But when we're doing things we shouldn't do and we see the error, the sin, if true repentance has taken place at salvation, it ought to change our want to today. You say, some people in the uh, Arminian camps who believe you earn your salvation by your works, they say, well, if I believe like you Baptists do, I just get saved and go out and live in the old way I want to. No. <clears throat> I live the way I want to because <laughs> God put a new want to in my heart when I got saved. A new want to. And so I sin all I want to. <laughs> Does that make sense? Because I want to sin less than I did before I got saved. And what this old world needs to see is Christians who have a testimony that life can be changed and it can be different when their faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then maybe they'll want what you've got. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you that you have given us examples of what repentance is. And Lord, that when you came as the babe in Bethlehem, you came for a specific reason, to save your people from their sins. And Lord, if we're going to be saved from our sins, we must have that repentance experience that changed our attitude towards sin. That now we don't want to sin. We may stumble into sin from time to time, but it's not that we have a desire, an ongoing desire to sin like we did before we got saved. I pray that you'd bless us with true repentance, those who have not been saved. I pray that you'd bless those ones who are saved with a recurring repentance that they would repent every time they see something that doesn't bring fruit forth for you. Bless our invitation time in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand with me, please? Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. As the piano plays, I invite you to come if you need to pray.